of our naturalists while doing game drives, we always came across one common question, you know, and the question was, how did you become a naturalist? How did this all start? What made you love your job? And how did you fall in love with nature? So let's hear it from our expert panelists who have joined in and uh, who are doing guiding for many years and uh, hear it from them about their joy of uh, being a naturalist. So let me introduce you to our expert panel. We have Narendran, who is living in Kotayam in Kerala. He is our senior naturalist in Rainy Pani and started his career in 2006 and joined Rainy Pani Jungle Lodge in 2005. Narendran has been a part of various surveys, uh, even in Satpura and even in Kerala for different wildlife from birds, reptiles to mammals. We have Jason, who is also a naturalist in Great Pani, and Jason is also from Kerala. He visited his national park first in 1999 and uh, joined Rainy Pani in 2004 in 2016, sorry, and started his naturalist career in 2004. Uh, Jason also worked as a biodiversity tour leader in South India for five years before he could uh, join Rainy Pani. We have Siddharth Beniwale, a dear friend from uh, Pune, uh, Maharashtra in India. Uh, Siddharth has done his MSc in geology and uh, worked as a naturalist for the last six years. Uh, Siddharth has also worked with us in Rainy Pani, but now he is doing his PhD, so he's living in Pune. But he's also worked in parks like Madhumalai before joining Rainy Pani Jungle Lodge. So uh, we're going to have Narend, who's going to start the session. Narend, can you hear me? Narend, you can unmute yourself. Yep. Yeah, 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 I can hear it. Perfect. So Nareen is going to start with the session. Over to you, Nareen. Yep. Okay, good evening, everyone. And thanks, Erwin, for the uh, kind introduction. I hope all of you can uh, hear me, right? Uh, Erwin, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. You can start, Narin. So, as the uh, urban um, um, action, like I started um, my nationalist career in the year 2006, and uh, it was not like there was something like this, and I was walking forward to it to become a naturalist. So, I was always interested in nature and uh, uh, being in the outdoor. came to me uh, during my chi early childhood days. Uh, I think the total influence goes to me, uh, uh, to the, uh, my um, no, forefather's place, because, which I used to visit during my uh, school vacations, uh, which is uh, in the backwaters of Kerala. So the only way of reaching those places were by traveling on a, a motorboat. Uh, there is no other road connections in those days. And, you know, being traveling on the big water bodies, you know, seeing greenery everywhere. So I think that's something which kick started maybe when I recall uh, from how this passion started. And later on, uh, probably like when I went to the college, it was my uh, colleague who was a keen birder who introduced uh, uh, me uh, to this world, seeing my uh, interest in observing uh, things around even though I wasn't uh, no, taking it serious those times. So he was a person who uh, no, guided me and started teaching me about birds and butterflies. So, so we used to hang around all, all our you know, free time or during the weekend when we don't have college you know, because we are both from same uh, place. Um, so we used to travel in different you know, uh, backwater sites and uh, paddy field looking for birds, butterflies. So that was my uh, start. And then, uh, along with them, then we even started a, a nature uh, club in our college. So the whole idea was to again 
uh, the same interest what we have just to even take our friends also to those places and show the nature's beauty and but the uh, the turn my life changed when i uh, uh, joined a nature society in kerala uh, which is known as uh, kottayam nature society because until then it was just a time pass of no or it was just a fun uh, not it, not much seriousness was there uh, even though we used to travel a lot and uh, start observing this uh, beauties uh, so that changed my life i can say because uh, this, this is an ngo which is based in kottayam and uh, which used to and take lot of projects and do lot of ground works in conservation in that area mainly related to uh, wetlands wet, wetland ecosystems and so initial days it was uh, when we start with doing bird surveys wetland bird surveys so i thought okay so so while i mean solely birds for that, that, that particular time but then things are changing as we start undertaking more and more projects for the forest department like you know we start doing surveys not just for birds alone we start exploring on butterflies then on frogs or uh, even on dragonflies but not a lot of other uh, that's when i started realizing this you uh, know many more things in, even in that ecosystem so i and even earlier so because the idea of forest was also changing for me because i come i came from a place where there is no forest in kerala natural forest so it's a different ecosystem altogether and so, so things are changing so while working with this organization so so we used to uh, we used to be part of various uh, you know um, uh, programs so we like, I, I used to also volunteer with them so like in terms of conducting bird surveys or butterfly surveys and even um, um, being part and uh, traveling to various forests and habitats and learning about different wildlife so yeah so while working with them that's when uh, accidentally got uh, an opportunity to work in a hospital industry as a naturalist so i was actually clueless that at that particular time what i could do there but then after speaking to uh, colleagues who are already in the field you know it's very simple like it's uh, you know it um, it's not something like you're working so it basically uh, okay you, you are part of that industry but you are almost like on a, on a permanent holiday so that attracted me and and then since then there was no looking back so i i worked at a uh, different uh, property uh, before i joined uh, rainy pani so the first uh, the place i worked was uh, a place called gokarna uh, which is in north karnataka so it is a complete shift from you uh, know in terms of language the forest type everything uh, not much of bird life but there is a place which uh, you know, allowed me to focus a lot of reptiles especially on snakes so that's the time you know I, apart from you know observing birds and butterflies and frogs and everything i started observing reptiles more when i reached there because there were plenty so every nook and corner of that place we had uh, and it's just a scrub jungle and you uh, know dry jungle there and it's also on the coastal side so bird life was there but not much but so this was the main attraction so uh, therefore a couple of years then uh, moved to another place so which was uh, probably one of the which the area which has one of the highest density of uh, uh, herbivores in the world in, in in asia basically which is uh, called nagarwada national park uh, which are famously famous uh, called as uh, kabini so i was associated with uh, another property called orange county over there and i was there for 6 years and i had a fantastic wildlife experience over there and no uh, especially uh, i was more happy to be there because uh, no uh i could watch and uh, observe more of, uh, about my favorite animal which is elephant so i was more happy and that made me stay there for long uh, so after that i start realizing that of course i, I should uh, you know, explore more wildlife areas and then and also in different activities and that brought me to sapura and renipani so yeah so cuz again uh, another interesting part of being sapura is that as you all know as most of been here you know diversity of activities and so that means you have access to the forest in different means and you are also seeing you know, different parts of the forest uh, and different wildlife you are coming exploring so so that made me uh, stay here so far i've been having a great time and uh, um 
I start exploring things and I also love to document things like it's not just right making of my own checklist and writing my observations. Apart from that, when I was able to do that, I start, uh, you know, start um, videographing uh, you know, various wildlife which start uh, uh, coming across me. So I'll be sharing some of the moments uh, with all of you. Hope you all like it. So to start with, uh, so before Irvin uh, shares that screen, I'm just uh, going to give a brief idea about the, the first um, you know, wildlife experience I'm going to share right now. Um, Evan, you can start sharing. Okay. Yeah. So this is about, I, start, uh, I will start with my um, the favorite uh, animal, which is uh, elephant, as I mentioned earlier. So this is an animal which, we can, uh, which will never make you bored. Because it, it can watch like, uh, I, I, uh, especially I can watch for 24 hours. Uh, um, it's always will be doing some of the other activities. And uh, no, not many animals uh, can keep you occupied like that, I feel, and in my opinion. So, so this is one such behavior I'm going to um, uh, share with you all. So kindly, please do watch the uh, video, then I'll come back to what was happening there. Evan, you can play that. Okay. So I hope uh, all of you are able to see that uh, very clearly. Yeah. So in this, uh, you know, no, uh, no, elephant feeds on uh, various uh, things like the, the browse and also graze, uh, primarily browser. But at times you also see them uh, debarking trees. So this is a tendency, uh, uh, very frequent scene during the dry season, but they do, do that throughout the year. Again, which is uh, part of the diet. So, so that's what you've been seeing there. And many times you know, people ask, how do elephants debark? You know, or, um, or one of the uh, most, uh, one of the uh, questions which I have come across more, one of the most time was, what is the role of a task for an elephant? So you know, in general, it's basically to you know, for the, uh, in terms of Asian elephants, only the male will have the long task and which is uh, mainly to, uh, for a display. But and uh, you also see them uh, using that for you know, sometimes digging the ground or even debugging. But he, this is the case of a female here. I think probably once the elephant came close to the tree, you have noticed the uh, small teeth, which is known as tushes. So um, it uses the help of its tushes uh, to initially uh, to break the bark and then using it trying to peel it off. So that's what's been uh, shown in this. Yeah, but you can. Uh, play. Yeah. So as you all saw in this um, uh, video, so you saw an elephant you know, rolling in the mud. So this is also a video. Uh, both this uh, elephant video is taken from the land of elephants, uh, uh, Kabini. And in this case, this was during the monsoon. You know, uh, I think we are all aware that you know, elephants uh, do take mud baths or roll in the mud. Basically, you no know, different reasons though. Basic one of the main reasons is to keep their body temperature cool. You know, elephants with a high metabolic rate, so it will uh, uh, generally uh, generate more heat in their body. And also to add that they have a very dark skin and also the skin very thick, and with um, no set gland in the body or very little set gland, so it's very difficult for them to uh, maintain their body temperature. 
So this is one of the uh, behavior which they do to keep the body temperature under control. So usually we see is the mud bath, but whenever possible, especially uh, near the water bodies or during rains, you see them doing uh, following. So that's what uh, the behavior which uh, happened. So, um, so this is also another interesting thing because people always ask whether elephants uh, you know, sit on the ground or lie down, so whether it's easy for them or not. So very rarely they do that. So this that's why I chose to uh, you know, I selected this video to play and to share with you all. So this is something which they do quite often, but which is very uh, uh, rarely observed by us. Uh, even you can play the next one. Yes, no, really. Yeah, yeah. So um, here, what you've been seeing is um, a crested serpent eagle, which is a uh, uh, primary, uh, no, one of the primary diet. You know, as the name indicates, you know, it's known to feed on snakes. So I was very happy when I uh, witnessed to see this uh, amazing bird with a uh, snake kill, because um, we know they do, uh, you know. Uh, the, the name suggests uh, crested serpent eagle. That means they feed on snakes, and they've got special skills to uh, to do that. And but <clears throat> uh, never got an opportunity to capture this before. So I've seen them feeding other things, but so I was lucky in this particular case. And uh, the, the, this particular uh, video was taken in Satpura, and few uh, about three years ago. And in this case, it is a very long uh, rat snake, a non-venomous snake. Um, and so I didn't I, I didn't see it um, um, no, killing the prey. So when I reached the spot, I only saw it uh, feeding on it, <coughs> and I was happy and started recording it and <coughs> observed his behavior for uh, some time. And as we have to look for other um, no, big game around, I start, we we had to keep moving. Uh, I don't know what has happened uh, later to that, whether it's finished the skill or not. So as you all know, <coughs> so they've got uh, special adapt adaptations to to bring down this. Uh, kind of uh, you know, prey animals and because these are not uh, very easy targets because there are some snakes so even i has noticed that all the um, with the uh, highly venomous snakes like russell's viper also and this particular snake for example a rat snake it's very long and it can even easily constrict this bird but this bird uh, successfully brought it down so so one of the uh, key feature of this powerful uh, feature of this bird is this uh, strong talons and also the large scale which protects uh, the, uh, the, the eagle from getting bitten by the and, and is also good reflexes to uh, avoid the snake bite and quickly seize the prey before it could do anything. So I was very happy to see the uh, uh, this uh, uh, bird with the scale itself. So next one is a special moment from Satpura, uh, one of the iconic species and a special moment. So after this, uh, you'll be able to see that. Uh, Irvin, uh, could you please pause, Irvin? Yeah. Yeah. So what you just observed was a, a sloth bear, uh, which just came down from an uh, Indian jujube tree. And so, now, as you all know, these are basically primarily feeding on termites and ants. 
but they also appeared on uh, seasonal fruits and berries which is available in the forest so in this occasion they were uh, on this tree which is fruiting and they have their own uh, way of uh, uh, collecting them so in this particular case and uh, what it was doing was it went over to the tree and used its body weight and was shaking the branches and um, uh, making all the berries uh, fall on the ground and then coming down so in this particular scene so this is a, a female bear which was having um, uh, two cubs so right now they are not seen in the frame i'll be seeing soon soon so this is a special sighting because um, um, not many people are there at that particular time probably uh, siddharth and myself were the only people who witnessed this particular scene now we've seen a good number of bear sightings and even long sightings but uh, this particular sighting like for example a mother's care when his cubs are in danger is uh, uh, visible in this uh, which is something which i never came to a bear will do like this and or things like this will happen so that's why this is so special because uh, when we reached the site i think probably i was one of the last uh, jeep to reach the particular site by the time the bear was visible but was at a distance so my by the time others already had a great sighting and probably they all started leaving so i decided uh, to stay because i saw like they're moving and probably the high chance of getting them from the other end of the road so we went and waited there and um, <clears throat> yeah so after waiting for more than an hour uh, i mean while uh, <clears throat> the patience and time is the key so we decided like since my my i even asked my guest like we have many safaris shall we take a risk for waiting and getting this uh, great sighting and they were okay with that and we waited the bear came and they you know it was digging for termite for a long time around uh, close to us and the the cubs crossed in front of us and even the uh, mother bear crossed and they all went to the tree and so you can see like you know um, the cubs stay with his mother for probably about two and a half to three years so that's the time that the mother teaches them to you know, uh, teaches the survival skills for them so this is one particular things and sometimes you feel like okay, probably the cubs are blindly following them but these are again you know this is the way they taste the cubs so uh, yeah so the mother has done the job so she is now back to the ground foraging on the berries which have fallen down so now we'll see what's happening to the cubs uh, could you please play that video yeah so how was that as anyone seen this before so I, I even i never expected this to happen i never knew this could happen also I, even if you notice uh, i was focusing on the the main run expecting that even the bears also is going to follow the same path that the mother took so but that never happened i am not sure what exactly happened there like for example whether cups fell off I mean, they lost the drip on that tiny branch or they or try to take a shortcut so that is mystery but anyway that didn't work really well for them uh, at the end what we saw was uh, you know, the two little cubs uh, roughly about two years old were hanging like two you know, teddy bears on the little branch so the mother was wondering for some time i think you might have noticed them looking in both the direction and finally realized the one of the upper branch was in more danger the other was almost able to reach the ground so then uh, mother lane sings desire to go after the other one and help the little one to uh, ground it so that was so special so the next one is also of one of uh, uh, one of the iconic species of this park 
in fact uh, one of the least uh, um, uh, studied carnivore or predators of the indian forest and this is also a special moment because i always want as we, we as seen the different behavior of animal in different parks but never seen a proper hunt happening I means uh, the whole hunt and in this park in tapura i was lucky to witness one and here we go Irwin? Yeah. Yeah. So, on this this particular uh, no, um, sighting happened almost three years ago in Tapura again, and it's one of the morning drive in February, and uh, it's almost in the start of the summer. On that particular morning, I was actually you no know, uh, tracking a leopard. There are fresh tracks, and uh, you know, we were following that, and uh, almost like half half an hour into the safari. And after reaching one junction, like we lost the bug mark, and so we are like, us like, then we start, um, we lost the hope of you know, finding a leopard. So we stopped the vehicle and we have started making new plan. That's when, from a distance, we heard some sound. Initially, thought it's an alarm call, but um, couldn't figure out exactly what it was. So we decided to rest to the spot, which wasn't too far. And we went to that, and this is what we got. Uh, it was a pack of seven wild dogs which was trying to bring down, bring down a, a newly born calf of a god. So um, it, it couldn't celebrate its uh, next birthday. So it is uh, brought down by the pack on the same day it was born. And uh, a lot of interesting things happened or some other mysterious things. Uh, we don't know what exactly happened there or why. Because the mother, the mother was uh, doing her job protecting her calf. You must notice that, and the initial time it was that that's when the action started. So they were trying to take the calf away uh, between the legs of the mother and to you know, kill it, but the mother was uh, protecting it. And um, towards the end, it's almost you know, after an, uh, more than an hour, they were able to you know, drag it uh, towards the road and drag it to the other side of the road. And that time, when I see the the pace in which the wild dogs were attacking and the pace in which the mother god was uh, defending was everything was very slow that is it was giving that they were all tired after such a long uh, fight and even the, the hardly any sound came from the the calf the babies also so it continued for long and the whole sequence lasted for almost uh, two and a half hours uh, the calf was nearly dead and that's when we had is uh, another visitor a uh, jungle crow in fact, uh, um, probably if you notice the video, like you can hear it, but it was calling its other mates also before the top of that. Hmm. 
yeah. Yeah, no. I didn't know how this crow ended up in that scene. Um, how it is because usually we come to know like the scavengers come when the kill is made, or only after the uh, the predators left the scene for other uh, other scavengers to feed. But this came even before the kill was made. It was not only this individual, even there was also a tree pie which was waiting eagerly for that, but uh, couldn't um, capture that moment in this. And <clears throat> yeah, because the time is running out, then after almost, and, and I was, but I was like, uh, and it was only one Jeep uh, which was uh, witnessing this whole scene. And uh, so since it was breakfast time, we had to move ahead for it. And then we decided that okay, we'll go out, just getting too hot. But then we decided that okay, we'll quickly check one more time again what has happened to that scene. When we returned after almost half an hour, what we saw was again the calf was dead, but the mother was not giving up the carcass to the the wild dogs. She was still defending it. And instead of uh, coming out early from the park on that particular time, we even waited till the park ending time. But the wild dogs weren't successful to steal the carcass from the mother. Um, even I don't know what has happened to the carcass, but uh, in the very next day when we went, there was no trace of the carcass at all. So uh, hopefully the dog's uh, mother might have given up and the wild dogs were, might, might have success, uh, succeeded to take the carcass. And another interesting part of this was, it is not there in the video, but there was a big herd of God, which is not too far from this incident, which is just on the other side of the hillock, which is not visible in the scene. But, and the sound which was of the car was heard more than a kilometer ahead and that's when we reached spot. But the herd which was very close, we didn't respond at all. So that still remains a mystery. Um, we, yeah. So now, uh, next, another one is, uh, again, going back to Kabini. Yeah. yeah, so this is the final uh, moment I want to share uh, in this session. So this, again, um, this took place many years ago and we always tell, you no, know, once you are in the forest, you don't have time to blink your eyes. And this is exactly what has happened on that particular drive also. Uh, it is almost towards the end of the last drive it happened. So there are many, and, and that's the time, you know, you see all the cars uh, leaving the gate. And this incident happened just two kilometers before the gate park gate. And since we have many vehicles in front of us, we decided to keep some distance and then we'll move ahead. So we just stopped for hardly a few seconds, and that's when you heard some sound. You know, uh, in this particular park, there is that that uh, it's actually happened on a, on a on the side of a road, a state highway, which divides you know, cuts through the park. ended up uh, being the meal of this tiger. So, I watched the, almost the whole scene, but uh, couldn't capture the whole moment. Uh, only the few moments were captured. And it is also a special, it was standing in the road and tigers caught the neck of this cattle. And uh, eventually it pulled it down and brought it down. And it, it was a young male tiger, so not well experienced. That's why it couldn't drag the kill that easily. And another special moment was that before we reached that spot, it was actually another uh, public vehicle, another car was coming as witnessing the scene. And so we didn't see initially the tiger when he reached that road. What we saw was one vehicle avoiding something. And that's when we saw the car on one side and the tiger with the kill and or the uh, attack happening on, on the other side. And they left the scene quickly. And we stayed because seeing such a very rare moment. Uh, even though it wasn't a wild uh, prey, but uh, it was good to witness this uh, uh, the big cat bring down a prey. 
um, so that is so special and you have seen uh, in the video like the, ta uh, the tiger staring at uh, at something uh, continuously and nothing but it was actually responding to the sound from the vehicle uh, it always happened no um, and uh, it was actually a child crying because so actually the child was tired and was sleeping but seeing the tiger the and the parent got excited and woke the child up but then the child is screaming uh, without knowing what is happening and by hearing that uh, cry the, the tiger and left the scene um, that's what happened in the scene but since it was time over we had to leave so we couldn't wait for uh, to see what has happened later whether the tiger is alive or not but eventually later on since uh, it happened near the uh, park gate I, also on the state highway side and that two uh, tiger killing uh, cattle, village cattle. So I once I reached into the network, I informed the park ranger, and they sent a team and finally found out the tiger has taken the cattle inside the forest and um, it has uh, fed on the carcass. Yeah. So that's all I have to share with you all. I hope all of you had a great time. Yeah. Thank you, Narin. It was very interesting seeing your videos. It was brilliant. Uh, I was just going through the chat box and I saw a lot of questions coming up from the wild dog and the gore sighting uh, which was there. I remember even in this sighting, me and Ali uh, also eventually landed up there by hearing the sound of the calves uh, during our morning drive. Uh, though we couldn't stay for a very long time because our guests were feeling very sad about it. And, uh, you know, wanted to leave the sighting. So, unfortunately, we had to move out our cars and you were all left alone there. So, what was your reaction and your guest reaction? Uh, I would like to know uh, during that morning when this encounter took place. Yeah, well, honestly, I was very thrilled to see that action taking place. Of course, uh, when... Uh, there's always a different thought. No, no, I think is the way the this animal bring down the prey is, uh, is quite fearsome. So not many people can take this action. Uh, so the more even it has happened with me even before that. So even when wild dogs are being killed, even I had to leave the scene many a times because uh, they couldn't see or take that up. Uh, it was very difficult for them to observe that. So even the same happened even here also. Uh, even when my guests also want to leave the scene, even they couldn't uh, withstand this, uh, seeing this. Even they told me that we'll go. But uh, I tried, uh, I, I convinced, it took some time and I convinced them and uh, they just stay. But the most challenging part happened to me was, uh, it is not just the guests who want to leave the scene. You now in this park, uh, Satpura, uh, we also have uh, drivers. They, they are we're driving the cars and apart from that, there's also guides. So these two guys want to lead a scene, I think, before the case. So that is something which surprised me. And, and that, I think that was the most challenging part for me because I could convince the guests within three to five minutes, but uh, I had to give a, a, a session of about 15, 20 minutes to convince the driver and uh, the guy to stay there. In fact, uh, they want to chase away the wild dogs and you know, save the calf. That was, they want to do it, but... Um, then I had to uh, convince them and you know, they play in nature um, or you know, the both animal species has to survive. So it was a challenge convincing the guide and the driver. But eventually they supported and we stayed with that the whole duration in the park to witness the scene. Great, great. Thank you so much, Narin. So we have Jason next. And, uh, good evening, everyone. It's, it's, it's a great pleasure to meet you all on this platform. <clears throat> and uh, I'm really happy to share some of my experiences, not with the mammals, but with the birds. Uh, uh, just like uh, uh, Erwin told, I started visiting forest uh, towards the end of 1990s. Uh, I remember my first visit to a national park was maybe 1997 or 98. But in the beginning, when I started to go to the forest, I always wanted to see the big games. I'm originally from Kerala, uh, a South Indian state. And big games in Kerala means the big uh, herbivores like elephants, gore, and samba. But uh, 
comparatively uh, you know the tiger sighting or the leopard sighting overall in you know, in kerala is not as good as like in in, in central india so i always wanted to see the uh, kind of big herbivores but uh, i remember that most of those expeditions were uh, or ended very disappointing because i couldn't see any of those uh, animals but uh, on one of those explorations uh, a friend of mine who was with me who actually showed me some of the birds which are quite amazing and uh, following that i started to identify birds by myself and on those days the field books are not so easily available like now so what i or or my generation of of the bird watchers we usually do take field notes and uh, with the help of the field notes try to identify a bird uh from a field book which kept somewhere away so in my town there was a library and there there was a field book and the first bird that i still remember uh that i identified by myself was the uh this bird which is the gray fronted green pigeon which i i saw it uh, for the first time in in the peria tiger reserve uh since then uh after watching birds i realized that there are a lot of interesting things happening with the birds uh for me also in the beginning i always wanted to see the colorful birds or the birds uh, which make beautiful calls but later i realized that there are some interesting behaviors uh, happening with the birds so in the beginning i uh, uh, wish to see these colorful birds like malabar trogon <clears throat> excuse me this is a, a male a malabar trogon uh, which is very colorful we are seeing the back side of the bird the front side is uh, towards its belly side is a very bright red in color so when you when you see it flying in the canopy you feel like a, a flash of uh, fire flying so in malayalam the local locally it is named uh, after that so uh, then the malabar whistling thrush which is the high altitude bird which is always interested with the beautiful melodious call it makes especially in early mornings and the evening in the silent forests of of the munnar or or in uti if you go you can hear this bird and uh, this bird uh, we mostly hear than seeing them so that is the interesting aspect of of this bird so in the beginning as i told you earlier it was the colors or the sounds and uh, then uh, this might be the bird which i saw in action for the first time this is a kind of a rare bird which is the legis hawk eagle which is the close relative of the crested hawk eagle this bird particularly is having a very short small distribution in india it is basically basically confined into south india and also to sri lanka and uh, uh, when i watched this bird for the first time uh, i realized what is the power of uh, of a bird of prey like this because this was about to hunt a nilgiri langu young baby but it was it was uh, an unsuccessful attempt all the uh, troop members of the langur uh, they uh, very strongly defended it and chased this bird and this is the picture we have or my friend taken after uh, it flew away from the from the area so that given me the idea of of watching the birds especially towards its behaviors so on continuous birding uh, or the explorations i was more more focusing on the birds and their behaviors and uh, it's quite interesting to see that even though it's a very common bird if you watch it carefully you can see some interesting behaviors they they, they show in front of you it's not uh, it's not a performance it's actually uh, they are behaving 
these behaviors are mostly the ecological uh, you know the aspects of uh, these organisms that help them to survive in nature so in the coming slides i am going through uh, the different behavior aspects of the very common birds that i hope uh, will make you an interest on uh, on the birds or to watch the birds in more uh, keenly uh, like uh, you know on another occasion uh, uh, it was in 2002 or 2003 it was taken uh, in in a bird sanctuary in in kerala the takeard bird sanctuary most probably you may all hear about it and uh, these are the two birds uh, which are named as the frog moth the ceylon frog moth uh, contradictory to a, every other birds the female is more colorful than the male so in this picture you can see the one on the right hand side is the is the female and one sitting on the left hand side where the dried leaf comes as the background is the male so in 2002 uh, till then i couldn't see this bird so what i'm trying to tell you about an incident which led me to observe uh, the more uh, behavioral aspects of birds uh, was actually based on this sighting so when we were staying in in this sanctuary uh, and in an evening uh, all of a sudden we could hear the male bird was making the call so a friend of mine who was with me who was very good at mimicking the sound of the bird so he he responded with by imitating the sound of the male bird and we waited for a while and say about after four or five seconds the the ceylon frog moth male responded to his uh, voice so we we realized that the male is sitting somewhere close by so we started walking it may be about 6 30 or 6 45 in the evening uh, 6 45 uh, in south indian forest means it's pitch dark and it was you know after a rain there were a lot of leeches on the ground they all started to crawl on our feet and still we uh, we were continuing searching for this bird with a small torch in the hand and every five meters my friend was uh, making the call and uh, the ceylon frog was frog mouth was responding to to his call and we we assessed that the bird is sitting maybe about 40 or 50 meters away from us so we were walking very silently and in every five meters or 10 meters my friend was making the call call and uh, towards the end we almost reached at the place where the bird was sitting and it was very dark and we realized that uh, the bird was sitting just above our head and uh, my friend again made the call and the and the bird who was sitting there responded responded to that sound and we lit the torch above our head and then we saw another bird sitting over there that was a racketail drogo which is a very good bird which is very good in imitating the sounds in the forest in fact this bird actually was imitating or responding to the sound that my friend was making so this is quite unusual because the racketail drongo usually make the sounds uh, in the daytime because it's mostly a diurnal bird and there are several theories about why this bird is making uh, several sounds of or try to imitate the sounds of other birds so there are several theories but we couldn't figure out why this bird was making the sound in that night and that too to a call which is produced by a human being uh, that made me uh, you know in, uh, watching birds in more and more interesting way so i continued watching birds and uh, after that i could uh, observe one interesting aspect of the birds which eat the fruits you know uh, the red vented bubble uh, which is a very common bird that we see everywhere which eat fruits 
which is basically an omnivore it eats insects and also the berries uh, but when the bird like bulbul or a hornbill uh, eat the berries they swallow the the fruit as a whole and the the fruit uh, when they swallow the fruit the pulp will be digested and the seed will come out and these birds are actually acting as a seed dispersal agent of the nature but if you see a bird like a parakeet eating a fruit one thing that you can see that they don't eat the pulp at all if they are eating the berries of any kind of trees you won't see them eating the pulp part of the fruit instead of that they eat the seed they open the uh, seed pod whether it is hard or soft they open the seed pod they start to eat the kernel and they leave the most part of the kernel and they eat the growing bud that's the reason why if you see uh, a a parakeet eating something you will see most of the things that it is having uh, it will leave or it will drop you can see it on the floor you can hardly see them eating something it's it's a very small quantity of the fruit or the kernel it will eat so nature given uh, some birds uh, to, or to the to do the duty of the seed dispersal and the birds like parakeets or the sparrows they have a role to control the or to keep a check on certain kinds of trees and plants by eating the seeds of it so this is another uh, uh, thing which i could observe from the nature to two different aspects of uh, you know the to kinds of frugivorous birds a similar thing you can see if you see the pigeons eating uh, the berries they swallow the fruit they 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 help in the seed the dispersal but if you see the doves like spotted dove or the laughing dove they are mostly eating the grains so they are eating actually the seeds not the fruit so that is how the nature organized the birds to do you know or to maintain the uh, the cycle of nature that also made me interesting uh, watching the birds uh, very you know very deeply and uh, the bird watching continued and i joined uh, in renipani started to explore the sakura forest and my interest was always on the birds uh, uh, sakura also given me a lot of opportunities to see new species of birds which are uh, became my lifers uh, since i started to work in renipani in 2016 and first of all those lifers comes this bird which is the black crested bulbul uh, which i saw in pachmadi uh, i i i really like this bird because there is only a, a small difference between this bird and the flame throated bulbul in south india and the flame throated bulbul is having just a, a, a red throat uh, or red patch on its throat and this one don't have that red uh, red throat instead of that it is having a quite beautiful black crest and this bird is also having a very small distribution in it distributed in central india in in pachmadi and also to the northeastern states and uh, uh, another lifer for me in sakura uh, is the brown crane uh, and uh, next comes the indian skimmer so my point is that if you if you start to do bird watching or if you start to observe nature apart from the big games whenever you go to the forest there will be something to make you happy there will be a new bird there will be a new behavior of a common bird that will make you happy so, so this is what we usually hear working as a naturalist that after coming from the forest people generally say that no it was it was you know we couldn't see any big games the the thing is that the people if started to watch the nature in its details there will be a lot of things to to see and understand and next i am going to see going to show you some of the video slides uh, which are 
which are actually showing you some interesting behaviors of very common birds. Uh, the first one is uh, the nesting behavior of, uh, of a black hooded oriole. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a very common bird uh, for everyone because it's quite attractive with it because its colors and the sounds that it makes. But the birds which uh, uh, live around around the human habitations, I I observed that they sh always show a, a kind of dual behavior of searching for shelter and their basic shy behavior. So whenever you try to see them close, they will fly away because of their basic shy behavior. But they try to make their nest. Uh, near the human habitations. So this is a very typical example uh, of this uh, black hooded orion, which actually made a nest in 2018 near our staff quarters in Rainy Pani. Um, uh, you know, it was it was in June. They started make nesting nest in the June. They collected all the dried. Uh, of the soft skin from the tree trunk and made the nest maybe 10 or 15 feet above above the ground on a on a uh, tendu tree you know on an indian ebony tree so uh, we are watching this uh, the pair of birds which were making the nest and uh, like what i told you earlier they were not allowing us to go close to see the nest then they will fly away but when they feel that we are watching them quite far, then they were quite comfortable to come and uh, continue with the nesting. So this is this what I presume this is the female, and the male was always uh, keeping a guard of, of the seal, and he always tried to chase the other intruders uh, comes to that place. So the this was almost towards the end of the uh, of the nesting and. Uh, after after few days, uh, it laid eggs. That all uh, me, Narin, and uh, Siddharth was uh, watching it. And after few days, uh, it laid the eggs. It laid the eggs, and uh, it scattered uh, incubation. And all of a sudden, the southwestern monsoon started. Uh, after two or three uh, heavy rain, uh, uh, we realized that the the nest the bird that made was becoming weak and weak. The strands which were connecting to the branches were became very uh, worn out, and uh, we realized that the nest is not able to support the weight of the bird which is incubating along with the three eggs it has laid. So we were actually uh, watching this bird, uh, what is going, going on uh, and uh, 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 you can see the uh, heavy rain is happening but still the bird is sitting inside and you can also watch the, the strands, the pieces of the uh, bark of the trees on which is binded with the, on the tree branches, which all getting getting weak and weak. Uh, so uh, uh, after watching all these things, uh, we we decided to give an extra support uh, so as to protect the nest. Uh, we were quite reluctant to whether the bird will accept. The, the extra support that we uh, about to give, but uh, we took a chance. Uh, we got a piece of mosquito net and wrapped it all around uh, of the bottom and tied it to the two different branches. And we were quite skeptic whether the bird will come and uh, use the nest again. We waited there for quite for a while, uh, I think maybe 30 minutes or 45 minutes and after a while uh, the bird the female came and it checked all uh, all the nest once again by sitting on a branch which was quite away from the nest and uh, and after a few minutes 
let's see what happened after a few minutes she decided to come and sit inside the nest so even though it was a foreign body that uh, provided an extra uh, extra support to the nest it may be because of uh, its affection with the eggs or its instinct to hatch it to, to do the incubation it decided and sat inside the nest so that was one of the that was one of the interesting moment that uh, you know i heard that certain birds certain kinds of birds leave their nest irrespective whether they have nest uh, nest or eggs or the chicks if if it is disturbed by human beings i in my childhood experience i had uh, one uh, incident when a tailor bird left its nest when my uh, enthusiasm opened the nest in my childhood so i was quite skeptical but eventually this particular bird the black hooded oriole decided to come and use the nest and uh, in uh, that was i told you it was in 2018 june that was almost towards the end of the season we all left lodge uh, towards the end of june when we came back on 2018 october uh, we could see a young black hooded oriole flying around here following its parent birds it must be uh, the the bird which hatched from the nest that we have protected so this is what i told you uh, this is what i would like to share the experiences like uh, the birds which are uh, having uh, breeding around the human habitation they always seek this kind of help i think this is what their behavior shows always they always seek the shelter or the protection from the human beings as uh, this is also an interesting thing uh, then then i am going to sorry there was some internet issues uh, thank you so much jason for an interesting session and to show your experience uh, about whatever you have witnessed so far in the lodge and uh, some beautiful aspects of seeing birds uh, we have a question uh, which had come out from our guest uh, and the question was jason that uh, what how could you differentiate between uh, leggies hawk eagle and a crested hawk eagle so if you could answer that question uh, uh, quickly then we can go ahead to siddharth thank you shall i tell that now okay uh, the first and most important thing to uh, identify a leggis hawk eagle is according to their distribution the place where you see the bird is an important thing if you see it in in towards uh, south indian forest uh, there is a very good chance of it uh, as a uh, as a leggis hawk eagle and uh, compared to the uh, uh, crested hawk eagle Uh, if you watch it carefully the crested hawk eagle is having streaks on its belly or its chest and for leggis hawk eagle it is barring a reddish barring across the across the belly or across the chest so that is the uh, very distinguishing difference or distinguishing factor with which you can identify a leggis hawk eagle and again one more thing uh, the the throat of the leggis hawk eagle is almost plain which is creamish white in color which is not like uh, which is still having some spots of or barring on on the crested hawk eagle so the the area of sighting second these two aspects are the key uh, features to identify a leggis hawk eagle from that of a crested hawk eagle Thank you, Jason. You are welcome. So, over to you, Siddharth. Now. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can no. hear you, Siddharth. Yeah, yeah. So, without any delay, I'll just uh, start with the presentation. Uh, thanks, Irwin, for the intro. And. Yes. As 
driven uh, like I just no being and so quickly I just tell you how I college uh, I saw that geology students are the one who travels quite a lot and they get every time they go out on excursions uh, though right from school days I was uh, interested uh, seeing birds and I used to go in nature walks and then even for nature orientation camps uh, here I like so I uh, started learning about geology, uh, took it in academics, and in my uh, post-graduation, I did dissertation on a very interesting topic, which was uh, sand reef or tube worms. And here the intermix came from, like I was understanding uh, coastal areas, coastal beds, and organism from a bio biogeological point of view. And that's how I began to uh, start exploring things where all these uh, like geological formations are being reworked by uh, flora and fauna and then i became a naturalist so today's today i'm just gonna take you uh, within the time machine because uh, my today's topic is geology of sapkura which actually fascinated me uh, before joining rainy party so that was actually a plan and then I'm working uh, forward on it. So Sakpura is very unique landscape. Uh, you can see my cursor over here. And <clears throat> right here, uh, as I move my cursor, Sakpura is actually lying in the southernmost part of Madhya Pradesh, the state, uh, right in the middle of the heart of India. And Sakpura actually is like a boundary of uh, like northern boundary for Deccan tracks and it's uh, divides the southern plateau and the plateau for the second plateau. So let's begin our journey in time machine. And as you know, like uh, Alfred Wagner, he proposed the theory of this continental drift. Somehow like I was so fortunate I found this video on YouTube and I'll even share the references. So these are some animations and I just go through uh, what all happened in all these, uh, sorry, what all happened in all these ages. So we start with Cambrian age, which is actually, uh, so before Cambrian age, Anvas was all scattered. There was more area covered by water and then all igneous eruptions started coming again. And about the first sort of rock formations were formed. And in Cambrian, our first invertebrates came into existence. How, we how everyone knows about it is all the recorded fossil forms in sedimentary rocks. Uh, then we come to Ordovician period, which is age of grapholiths, which are earlier fishes. And so as landform was changing, it was uh, different tectonic plates coming together and Pangaea was forming. There was less water, like less uh, of sea water and fresh water started forming in these sort of areas with the landmass. And Silurian period was actually a vascular structure and they started supporting themselves against the air. Later come the age of fishes where, uh, and then from uh, fishes obviously we know all our amphibians were formed. Now, Now, as we come to this, yeah, yeah, this Carboniferous age, you can already see that different patches of land has come together, and this entire sequence formed the Gondwana land, which is actually the main land or biggest land uh, scattered everywhere in different plates. So as we go ahead, in Permian time, fossil, uh, like first plants were formed and first trilobites in of areas. So now you can actually guess where our Sakpura is. So this, where my cursor is, this is a part of Gurdwara. 
this entire is Gondwana, and this is a part of area where Satpura is formed later on. So this is the Triassic age, is the time or time span when Gondwana started shaping, all the sediments were uplift, uplifted. So first were Bindin. So as you come from Bhopal, you cross a big massive escarpment of rock and that range is called Bindin range. And later on Satpura was formed uh, with the sediments deposited by ancient rivers. And after tri Triassic age, as everyone see in the movie, I don't have to talk much about it. After time of dinosaurs. So if you go, if you travel towards Jabalpur from Satpura, in Narmada areas or Narmada escarpments, there are even fossils which are found of uh, those age. And all the primitive fossils of carnivores and uh, herbivores dinosaurs are still getting recognized from that area. And later comes the Cretaceous, which was the evolutionary phase for uh, dinosaurs and appearance of flowering plants. And then we, we started existing. So in early Cretaceous, you can see our entire Indian plate has uh, uh, broke down from its African origin and Australian parts. And Gondwana starts going, like Gondwana starts moving towards uh, Eurasian plate. And as soon as it collides, the youngest folded mountain chain was formed, and that is Himalaya. So I just, yeah, now you can see the plate is moving towards this Eurasian plate, and it's just about to strike. And then you see the formation of Himalayas. So Satpura is, in geological time scale, Satpura is the old, oldest, uh, like, Aravali is the oldest in India, then Vintin and Satpura is the third oldest. And then volcanic eruption happens and then Himalaya. So we move to the next slide. And this is just to give you a quick glance of the processes which happened and then uh, what we discuss about Satpura. So this is how Satpura looks like in, so as you go back in like understanding geology, we always keep talking about rocks. So these yellow patches are like lower Gondwana sequence, which are the older sort of sediments in Gondwana. And then upper Gondwana sequence are marked as red. Just to orient you, sir, everyone again, I have marked Bhopal and this entire sequence is the basin. And this is the Son. Son is a valley very close to Narmada river. And this is our, our Satpura formation. So if we take a vertical section in uh, hillocks of Satpura, this is how it will look like. So at the base, there is obviously granitic craton, which is, which is not shown over here. Then red patch is volcanic eruptions, which are Deccan traps, and they're uh, like younger in formations. Most of Satpura is marked by Pachmari sandstone. And yes, as we go to buffer areas, we get to see all these conglomerate looks like. So um, same? you can see all these same? cross bedded things. So these so that, are layer by layer formations. Uh, um, so that can you hear me? Just, uh, just can you check your connection once your voice is cracking a bit? So that at the same time, there are lots of processes happening around. Like there is I think uh, there's a little bit of. Yeah, I'm back up. Yeah, uh, I think there's a little me, internet problem, so your voice is cracking. We can hear you now. Okay, okay, okay. So, yeah. So, this is how the sandstone looks like. As we go towards Pachmari, there is like 750 meter thick straight wall of sandstone and even in sandstone while it was forming there were breaks so these yellow lines are not painted over there but just to tell you about these all these white white patches over here these are quartz grains which were realigned as Satpura was uplifted 
and these sediments uh, got new shape or these are like we call it in geological term we call it like veins of uh, quartz oh i think i uh, forgot to change my slideshow not really so this when we watch all these animals what fascinates me is there is something missing and recently i was writing a paper on rusty spotted cat and i was uh, surprised that in other papers there is no mention about uh, the rock formations or type of habitats and like habitat is mentioned but uh, what is based uh, like the habitat is obviously based on its little laws and stuff like that so this rusty is actually standing on conglomerates so these are nothing but uh, big big pebbles and boulders and massive rock chunks cemented in matrix of sediments or the sandstone hope no one is yawning like this again the slipper is sitting nothing on but one of the formations like unique formations standing inside the rock formations is called dike or walls so uh, many of you are from uk and even you have got basalt and here you can see i have used my geologists are known to use any funny things for scales so i had nothing in my uh, hand at that time so i just uh, took a photo of my shoe and these crystals are plagioclase crystals which are igneous in their uh, uh, mineral formations so what are shaping satpura after forming such a big landscape was nothing but the agent weathering agent and that's water and it still continued to form plateaus gorges and peaks and it still continues along with existence of recent fossils like these crocodiles over here and what is this so i just included this slide to tell you about that this rock cycle still continues and now recent type of uh, polychaetes and all the invertebrates they are still shaping these rock formations or the sandbars and mud flats so this never stops how can i forget when like how can one forget about bean betka and the shelters when you talk about satpura so i have just included some slides of bean betka and the recent ages a uh, lot of hindu temples were formed in satpura so were kept but there is hardly any documentation done the stuff architectural remains are inside the national park so though get the uh, though they are protected they are less studied for missions and this is how our you the decorated that fascinating landscape which welcomes you whenever you visit satpura so it's not just rocks formations but there are so many unique things which actually shape up and i'll just tell you an, an example jason told about his life of bird the bulbul which is found in uh, satpura this unique habitat that stands on these sort of heights of pachmari uh, holds such a nice forest where species are even interlinked with himalayas and isn't it fascinating yeah over to you over <laughs> i think so that there is some internet problem on your side yeah we are having quite poor connection today but i guess you are able to see the slides right yeah 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 i think i have said this done so do you have any questions for me perfect perfect thanks for that for your information so without wasting any time because uh, we are running short on time so uh, we are opening up the q and a session so in case you want to ask any question please feel free to unmute yourself and ask questions to any of our naturalists i have a question for narendra or jason can you hear me yes we can hear you yeah so i basically want to know because you are from kerala why is the silent valley called the silent valley i heard a story 
years ago that it, it is the only tropical forest in the world that doesn't have crickets, or cicadas you call them, or crickets. And that's why it's called silent. Is that the reason or do you know? Yeah, uh, so I, I would like to share my experience in Silent Valley. Uh, when I visited uh, many times over there, I could hear the cicadas. So it may be uh, the, the Europeans who may came to Silent Valley for the first time, maybe because of the peculiarity of the season, uh, they couldn't hear the sound of the cicada. But actual in uh, you know scene or scenario scenarios that there are cicadas so it is not silent without uh, cicada that, that is my personal experience so the answer is i don't know whether it is uh, straightly related with the absence of cicada over there yeah thank you philip uh, we yeah. have another question for Jason, by Rukuja, that hi Jason, my question is for you that the mosquito net experiment that you did with the net, would you advise people to experiment like that? Wouldn't that be interfering with the natural cycle? It's definitely it's an interference with the natural cycle. Uh, you know, we could leave the bird and its nest to the to the climate or the weather. Uh, and so on. But uh, as we were watching the bird continuously, say about 15, 20 days, even from the beginning of the nesting, uh, we couldn't do that. So that is the reason why we decided to give an extra support to the nest. It is, it is not advisable to everyone to follow because as I told you, there are certain birds which leave the nest if it being disturbed by people or human beings. So there are chances. So in this case, we took a chance because we had a personal uh, attachment with this pair of black hooded Oreo. And that is the reason why we did it. Thank you, Jason. Welcome. Any other question? Yeah, this is Sachin here. Am I audible? Yes, Sachin, you're audible. Yeah. Hi. Uh, see, I, I stay in Thane, just uh, below the Yaur jungle. Borili National Park. Uh, th this year we are okay. here, we are getting a very peculiar uh, thing. Like the birds, especially uh, quail, kingfishers, magpie robins, and we have one starling which is found only in Yaur and directly there in West Bengal. They start their chirping and everything at two thirty, three o'clock in the morning, and not at five five thirty, which is what we have seen for the last ten fifteen years. And the second observation is. The nesting which starts typically in May 15 onwards is already started on April 15. So any sp peculiar thing why the uh, activity starts at 3 o'clock in the morning, it's too early for any bird. Jason, would you like answering it? Yeah. The birds like magpie robin uh, especially, it is having a uh, territorial call. The male make the territorial call uh, very early in the morning. And uh, uh, I don't know what was happening in, in Mumbai, but uh, towards Sakura this, this year, all the birds which are making or breeding during the summer are all started quite early. Uh, the spotted dove, say for example, they started nesting in, in the end of February itself. The first sighting that I saw was in, in the, inside the Sakura National Park itself. So I think uh, it's not only to that area, everywhere the birds started quite early this year uh, uh, nesting. So all these sounds that they make is related with the, uh, the breeding time. Uh, the, the, the magpie robin, the males make the territorial call. Uh, last year, I could hear it from 4 o'clock early in the morning when we were about to start the safari. So, uh, that is, uh, it is not unusual, I would say. Okay, okay. Yeah, even the crows have started their uh, nest in uh, first week of May and not first week of June. So, everyone oh, yeah. is early for one month. Yes, yes, almost, yes. Yeah, yeah. thanks, thanks. Welcome. 
Okay, we have another interesting question for Narendra. Uh, Narendra, we have Anurag Yadav. Narendra, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have Anurag Yadav who has asked you a question of our very own Ravan. Uh, that Narend, do you have any experience with him, like his behavior of hunting sloth bears? Uh, I haven't seen him hunting any sloth bears, like, but uh, once during the uh, the walk, walking safari in the park, I seen the carcass of a sloth bear, and even seen a big. Uh, no, male tiger's uh, bug mark and that is the time this tiger was active so uh, believing that uh, this tiger was responsible for killing that bear uh, but there's no evidence with us okay Narin. Okay. graham i think uh, ravan's question you would be answering it much better at this time <laughs> Any other questions, guys? Uh, can I ask? You could some... unmute yourself. Yeah. This is Amrit uh, from Transendus. May I ask uh, each of our experts if they have seen any change and what significant change they might have noticed in the parks uh, during COVID while uh, people are not visiting? if it's impacted the park positively or negatively in any way. Narendra, to you first, maybe? Sure, Narendra? Uh, regarding the wildlife activities, yeah. um, not sure. Uh, but definitely, it has affected tourism, though. Uh, but regarding the wildlife activities, uh, we are not sure when, what all. Uh, okay. Uh, but will it impact the conservation programs because of maybe a lack of funding perhaps going forward? I think uh, the lack of uh, the, the revenue or the funding will affect uh, the tourism uh, in the coming year. I think this is what I can presume. Because uh, what I know that most of the repairing works of the roads are all funded uh, from the you know the these kinds of amount they, they collected. So I don't know what is going to happen in the uh, coming year. But uh, what my observation, even though we couldn't, none of us could go to the park after the park being shut down because of the COVID nineteen. Uh, incident, but I, I'm pretty sure that uh, the animals behave as usual, uh, like whether uh, the, the gypsies are present or absent, because they are not performing in front of us, they are just behaving. So they are uh, going as usual, that's what I presume. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I just, okay, add, I, just I would like to add up to Amrit. Sure, sir. Question. Uh, so, yeah. So actually, uh, in Satpura, Pachmari is also in existence. So it's not only uh, like in Satpura. It's Pachmari is one of the town which is right on top of the protected landscape. And as there is less movement of people around, they'll be obviously dropping down in pollutions, especially noise pollution, air pollution, and percolations of uh, untreated water which straight down comes in the park areas and from the buffers <coughs> so that will be one of the good changes happening mm -hmm. when this covid situation is taking place okay yeah over to you Urban. thank you siddharth so we have another question from disha uh, hi team great session cardios to all my question is uh, recently i heard about the leopard in Satpura were extremely active due to which a lot of wildlife was pushed back in the core. How, was, how has the sighting and their activity been since? Disha, did you mean me, tigers in Satpura are extremely active? Disha, can you hear me? Hello? 
Disha? Hi. Yeah, hi. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Did you meant tigers instead of leopards in Satpura? Uh, I'm not sure at the moment, but I think I read about the leopards more than the tigers. Uh, no, leopards actually in Satpura have always been uh, active because uh, we used to not have a lot of tiger sightings uh, taking place in the park. But in the last few years, uh, definitely the tiger activity has picked up a lot into the tiger reserve. And uh, because of that, uh, the leopards and the bear sightings have dropped to a great extent because these big cats are strolling around the territory and marking. So now getting a leopard is uh, a little bit more difficult than what it was earlier. So leopards were always there more active in Satpura than tigers. Okay. And the topography, I just wanted to know about, uh, is it great for the tigers? Like uh, Satpura has a lot of hilly region. So is it great for the tigers and, or, you know, the topography is such that, you know, Tiger sighting in Sadhpura is supposed to be very extremely lucky and rare. That's right. I think Siddharth would answer this. So, topographically, it's difficult terrain to track tigers. And our tigers have got amazing areas to hide. And this is what we, were, we had been doing uh, in last years. Like, uh, our tigers, they have a hell lot of areas in their territory which are out of bounds in tourism because of the hilly terrain and that's why the movement of herbivores changes according to season like uh, in monsoon time everything is lush green and even on hill slopes of Pachmari and even top you see uh, gore and sambar in quite a lot of numbers and as summer approaches all these uh, uh, areas turn quite dry because of dry deciduous forest and then tigers also have to come down and this is the key like why Satpura can't hold a lot of tigers compared to other parts which are flat terrain but uh, Satpura can hold a specific number of tigers because the prey base keeps scattering all the time and that's the key uh, feature of Satpura and its forest. Over to you, Urban. Thank you. We have Ayan who's asked me a question. We heard about the tiger tested positive in by Corona in a zoo in US. What are your views on doing that forward? I think I am that uh, testing of uh, the Corona, which was uh, found in the tiger in US, was in captivity. So I think uh, really nothing to worry about uh, tigers so far in the wild. Touch wood, because uh, the tiger which was tested was in a zoo. Uh, I don't know. As if for now, we have not got any cases so far in India where our wild tigers are found uh, positive for coronavirus or a death which has been, uh, you know, suspicious and uh, stuff like that. So I don't think as if for now, that's a big concern with our wild tigers in India. Any other questions? You all can please unmute yourself. We'll go for the last question for tonight. Yes, I have a question. Can I talk? Sure, Philip. Please go ahead. It's for Siddharth, Jason and Narendra. What is your view on animals in tourism? Everybody loves uh, elephant ride. But do you support it? Uh, yeah, Philip, uh, regarding elephants, like anim animals in safari areas, yes, they're important because they really connect like these safari zones are actually our models to connect uh, like tourism can be used as a tool for conservation as well uh, especially regarding elephants uh, now it is banned or it's completely stopped to capture elephants from wild and then uh, go through all painful process of breaking down elephant and then use it like domesticate and use it but I would like to mention, like in such sort of difficult terrains where even your best 4x4 can't take you in deep inside jungle where you want to monitor tigers or uh, you have to keep all these animals and these habitat safe from the intruders or poachers. I guess elephant are the best way of patrolling. Uh, people have tried even horses. We don't feel so much concern about horses because 
humans have domesticated horses long back ago but when it comes to animals like tigers horses they spook and that's why elephant using elephants at least for patrolling is essential uh and safari if you treat animal well and if these elephants are breeded in captivity and then they are used uh, it's a good way to take people on elephant rides and bring them close uh, experience of wilderness yeah thank you this is my opinion and view uh narend would you like to give your opinion yeah so as to that as as i'm mentioning like no as you all know like uh, in many of the forest department has a uh, lot of uh, elephants in the captivity so there's no other major role for them so as the practice is happening right now so because they are mainly used for patrolling duties so really uh, uh, go with that suggestion because that's really good to have because as, uh, because in certain places where terrains are bad where you can't take the vehicle or you can't by walk yourself so that's a good way of reaching that particular spot um so uh, protecting the forest and even also for different other project like when it comes to you know translocation of animals so when you have to capture that so elephants are the best uh, method to approach closer uh, in camp because by vehicle there is always uh, you know, difficulties in that particular point if you will definitely uh, you know um, go with that because those captive elephants anyway we, uh, they most of them right now which we have is like small born in the captivity and already been trained or even captured from outside so which we can't let them back to the nature again because they won't be able to survive in habitat anymore so it's better to use them um, in a uh, better way but i personally don't uh, you know uh, like to have them for any joy rides that's my opinion but other five for this uh, nice horse like for patrolling the forest and all and that too for which is already in the captivity which is uh, good to use them. that's my opinion great uh, thank you narin and uh, so we are going to end our session because of uh, shortage of time uh, thank you everyone once again for joining in on our third virtual session of uh, tales of the bush uh before we end this we like to let you know our next topic for the week our next topic is wildlife uh, conflict management uh in india and uh, our two panelists who are going to join is mr dr uh, dr pabla who was a former wildlife uh, warden in uh, madhya pradesh and anish andheria who is the head of wct so these are our two panelists who will be there for a talk on the wildlife conflict management in india so hope to see each one of you again uh, next week and uh, thank you once again and good night